<clears throat> okay, we'll talk now about Henri Labrust, 1801-1875, a very important uh, 19th century uh, French architect. Uh, this was the man. Uh, and um, so let's read Henri Labrust, born on May 11th and died on June 24th. Today we are on June 25th was a French architect important <clears throat> for his early use of iron frame construction. Iron frame construction, and indeed was very important in his work. Labrust entered the Ecole des Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1819, so more than 200 years ago, won the Prix de Rome for architecture in 1824, and spent the period from 1825 to 1830 in Italy, after which he opened a studio in Paris. Labrust is primarily rem remembered for the two Parisian libraries he designed, the Bibliothèque saint Geneviève, built between 1843 and 1850, is still admired for the attractiveness and restraint of its decoration and for the sensitive use of exposed iron structural elements, columns and arches. La Brust is also remembered for his second library project, the Reading Room, 1860-1867, of the Bibliothèque Nationale, also in Paris. Its roof consists of nine decorated metal domes supported by slender cast iron columns. Um, so a few images of his work, uh, including um, his portrait, and here is a, you know, a sculpted work representing uh, representing Henri Labrust, uh, truly a, a very important uh, French architect. Otherwise, he would not have been immortalized in stone. Labrust, Henri Labrust, structure brought to light, and this is what you see is the ceiling of the of the reading room in in the Bibliothèque Nationale, the National Library of, uh, of, of France. Some drawings of uh, Henri Labrust. Uh, he was trained, you know, in the Beaux-Arts tradition, so ornament was, was um, always present. Manual work, of course, watercolor or whatever. Here we see glimpses of uh, his uh, famous uh, ornamental exposed iron work and uh, we are see the we are going to see the built work even here you see that you see structure these are structural elements but not divorced from ornamentation so this is important to notice that he had a preoccupation with a structure which was honest, but its honesty didn't say no to ornament. And ornament, in my opinion, is important. It's very difficult to have structure without ornament because uh, ornamentation is something, it adds a new dimension to structure. It softens, it makes it more sensitive and it, it brings structure to uh, positive negotiation with aesthetics. Now, this is a drawing actually from Viollet Le Duc, who probably influenced um, uh, Henri Labrust. A drawing by him. Historicism was, of course, uh, addressed at that time. You know, in the 19th century, uh, architects were very aware of what preceded them. We kind of ignore history now, but I think we can uh, we can still be ourselves without neglecting the past. Henri Labrust, Etude de reconstitution du Temple de la Basilique à Pestum. If you arrive in the south of France, in the south of Italy, sorry, please do not neglect to see the Heras temple. There are actually two temples in Pestum. For me, they are the most formidable architectures <clears throat> that I ever saw. I didn't see <clears throat> the whole world, but I saw the particularly Heras temple in Pestum. 
a very, very, very powerful architecture. It impressed Louis Kahn, who said, the temple, Hera's temple in Pestum is more important than the Parthenon in Athens. It impressed Goethe, it impressed Winkelmann, and it impressed Piranesi. Piranesi, who made a series of 18 or 17, 17 skate, um, etchings of this formidable temple. And it is said that actually the drawing by Labrus doesn't do justice to, to what is there, because the telluric force of the pre Doric columns is unbelievable. I read that uh, it's like a legend that uh, uh, couples which are not fertile, they spend the night in the proximity of the temple and they become fertile. It's possible. Anyway, Orila Brust. Uh, this again, uh, it's actually, this is the temple that I'm talking about, but but this is a very, you know, almost lifeless drawing or, or representation, graphic representation. The reality of the temple is, is, uh, is beyond words and beyond, uh, beyond uh, what we look at here, because here is a taint temple. That's the temple. It's called Hera's temple or the temple of Neptune in Pestum. The Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve, we are going to see the building. Orilla Brust. In a way, they infuriate me, these drawings, because they are so, I don't know, so removed in a way from life, from the conflicts of life, from the blood of life, from the passion of life, from, from, from you know, from the conflicts of life. Saint Genevieve Library. Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve, Place du Panthéon in Paris, 1838-1851. Here it is, but what is moving is actually inside. Um, people stay in line, maybe tourists or maybe school uh, people um, trying to see the famous work by Henri Labrust, and famous it is. The building towards the outside, okay, it's a container, a container of books. But inside, uh, you will be surprised by the, the poetry, the architectural poetry of his um, uh, exposed ironwork, which again, doesn't say no to ornament. Look at this. This is the reading room. I think it's beautiful, and it is beautiful because structure became ornamental. You know, it's almost like, uh, uh, you know, uh, longing for transforming architectural structure into an approximation of the wings of a butterfly. It's this light spirit, and it comes from marrying structure with ornament. Nobody asked him to, uh, to you know, uh, model uh, uh, ornamentally uh, this uh, curved beam. Why did he do it? Because he needed beauty. He needed uh, uh, l'esprit de finesse. Because uh, Boileau, a very important um, theoretician of culture, French theoretician of culture, said, uh, talked about l'esprit de géométrie, the spirit of geometry, and l'esprit de finesse the spirit of fineness. And in a way, it's talking about structure and ornament. Ornament brings that spirit of fineness, of grace. So the structure here, which is done um, in metal, in, in iron, is graceful and is graceful exactly because it assumes ornament. Now, of course, not every ornament is graceful. In this case, it is. You see the masonry of the walls, they are massive, but there is a feeling of liberation, of aesthetical freedom at the top of the room, at the top of the building. And you can speculate that maybe this is the role of knowledge, of reading, of knowing. It liberates the spirit. Or, as uh, Walter Gropp, you said, uh, um, a mind uh, works best when it is like an umbrella, open. Well, in a way here, 
it's almost some kind of an umbrella above this vast space of um, Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve by Henri Labrust to liberate the spirit. It's a very fine room. And as you can see, it's filled with people. Maybe the, qual the architectural qualities of the, of, the, of the room, of the space, uh, are conducive to, uh, to study. Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve, Henri Labrust. Uh, the plan is rectangular, but within this plan, because of the gracefulness of the design, uh, the the spirit of the of the of the of the building and the spirit of the interior is uh, is not rigid. And this is so thanks to this uh, graceful ornamental structure. Bibliothèque Saint Genevieve, Paris. But we see ornament also insinuating itself, you know, on the side, uh, you know, on these walls here. So, you know, the structure of these shelves itself contains some sculptural ornamental motifs. So there is, uh, you know, a relationship between the spirit of the ceiling and the spirit of uh, whatever is. Um, you know, uh, adjacent to the walls or, uh, you know, I don't know how the tables, I didn't study them in detail, but you see here, there are, there are things which are done very rarely these days because we are obsessed with the simplicity, but simplicity sometimes uh, falls into simplistic. And that's, that's not what we should, uh, should aspire towards. Henri Labrust. Who would say that this is not beautiful? I don't think there are many people who would say so. And that's because uh, ornament is, uh, is, uh, is a challenging structure to escape its uh, possibly morose uh, seriousness and uh, and sing uh, or dance or be you know light spirited and and this is important for architecture paul valery the great uh, french poet was right when he said well he, in his little book eupalinos ou l'architect eupalinos or the architect he said there are three kinds of builders there is a builder who places a stone above another stone, and he's a builder. Then there is a, a builder who places a stone above another stone and makes them talk. He is a master builder. And the third one is the one who places a stone above another stone and makes them sing. His name is Eupalinos or the architect. So here we see actually, well, it's not about stones in this case, it's about uh, uh, iron, but I think uh, if I am to allow to, sp to speak in, um, you know, exalted terms, uh, this structure sinks at the top. And, and for this, Onila Bruce deserves to be, uh, to be named Eupalinos ou l'architect, Eupalinos or the architect. It's not an extravagant song. It's not a loud song. It's a discreet song, but 
but it is important that it is a song. And within this song, ornament plays its role. Le Grand Seminaire de Rennes, devenu la Faculté de Lettres, puis des sciences économiques. Anyway, it's an uh, educational building, 1853-1872, um, in Rennes, not in Paris, rather austere towards the outside. But even here we see the beams, you know, trying to be less oppressive or oppressed even. The iron work of uh, Henri Labrust deserves uh, reflection and attention. Nineteenth century, Rennes. Now we, we we arrive at the second very important work by Henri Labrousse, the Reading Room at the National Library in Paris, 1854-1875. And this is a visualization, a graphic visualization of a room that was built just like this. Uh, you see Sal Labrousse in plan in the plan of the building. Maybe there could be again a new life for the bizarre uh, way of doing art architecture. Um, remains to be seen. This is the room. Uh, La Brust uh, Salle, uh, La Brust uh, room at uh, in, in this library, and I think again the building wants to sing. Thus again. Henri Labrousse deserves to be to be called the follower of Eupalinos or Eupalinos himself. I like very much this, uh, and again, talking about Walter Gropius and his idea that the mind works best when it is like an umbrella, open. Well, in a way, we see here open umbrellas, don't we? And this is the role of a library, of a reading room, to open up spirit, to open up uh, yes, uh, the mind through knowledge. And we see that it inspires even dancers, because between singing and dancing is a very short distance. Bravo to Ori Labrust. The reading room in the National Library in Paris. It's the same spirit in the dancers and in their dance and in the in the structure of the of the ceiling and the roof. Again, bravo to only Labrus. And bravo to his uh, uh, discreet, uh, graceful, ornamental iron work for the structure. It must be probably beautiful to study in this inspiring space. It does matter. It does matter. Because imagine you sit at one of these desks and you have a book in front of you and for, a, you know, uh, from time to time you glimpse, uh, you know, you look at, uh, at towards the ceiling and you see this um, symphonic work 
it lifts your spirit. It, 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 it makes you luminous and desiring for a better everything. The whole building was designed by other people. He only designed the, you know, the reading room of the National Library. And he was not afraid to take risks because when you look at this building, you, would, you wouldn't expect this kind of uh, termination at the top. Marilla Brust, Reading Room, the National Library, Paris, built mid 19th century. Now, there is also painting, there are frescoes, there are the books, there are the shelves themselves which are gracefully done. Uh, there are other things here, of course, but the generosity of the ceiling and of the roofing system is inspiring everything else. Within, within the building, within the room, the Labrust Sal, Labrust room. Why did he place this, you know, little, uh, you know, sculptural work here? Well, the, the, this room is about knowledge, no? It's about um, an idealized version of uh, life. It's about... Um, you know, uh, inspiring people and uh, sculpture could help. I mean, you know, I, I love these pictures, you know, I see here countless books and I see countless people and I see the modernity of screens, the modernity of um, electronic, uh, uh, you know, management of knowledge. And also I see the architecture of the 19th century. So it's, it's something sophisticated, cosmopol cosmopolitan. Is, uh, you, see, you see statues, you see, you see portraits of uh, famous people, meaning, uh, you know, people of culture. And we, you see the, 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 you know, the emancipation that uh, the structure of the, of the room uh, uh, that Labrust envisioned uh, inspire you towards. And it, it, again, I, I, I imagine it's a pleasure to, uh, to study there. You feel encouraged to believe in the world you are in and to believe in culture, to believe in knowledge. Very nice work. Now, uh, Hotel Touré Neuilly in Sursen, 1860. After we saw those two, li two libraries uh, by Labrust, uh, we can only do go downwards. But he built a few other buildings, as you can see. Villa Labrust. Actually, uh, what's this? I don't know. It was written Villa Labrust, but here is named differently. Did he live here? Maybe. I don't know. Very nice room, indeed. Another space where with, with great pleasure you would uh, open a book or uh, maybe even play the guitar or write a poem. Look at that glorious tall window and door. Very nice. Nicer than from the outside. Hotel de Villegris, 1865. I imagine in Paris. But again, after those two libraries that we saw, we can only move downwards, so to speak. So that was the short presentation of Henri Labrust. <laughs>